Dre, welcome to the Compete Everyday Podcast. Absolutely, Jake. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Man, this is going to be fun. I'm excited to talk more about your brand and work because I've gotten a chance to follow along some of it the last couple of years, uh, mainly because of the work you do in the speaking space as well. Uh, and you've built quite the brand, especially quite the audience on YouTube as well with all your videos and content. So man, before we get diving into your past a little bit, where you came from, how you got to this point, tell everyone what you do today. Uh, what is work on your game? And then, man, I want to take it back to the beginning. Sure. Well, today I'm the CEO of my company, Work On Your Game Incorporated. That's also named my brand and philosophy. It's all about taking the mental game tools that I had to develop in order to make it in the sports world. And I teach people, whether they're athletes, entrepreneurs, or business professionals, how to take those same tools and apply them to business and life. I love it. I love it. Well, let's let's flash back and talk a little bit on your sports career. If, if I remember correctly, you weren't always the most talented player coming out of the gate. In fact, it took a little while before you started catching some of that athletic stride. Uh, take us back to when you started playing. What, one, made you fall in love with the game? And, and two, uh, tell us about your growth in it. Yeah, well, the main thing, well, first of all, I'm from the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I didn't start playing basketball until about the age 14. I was always into sports, but I played a little football, a little bit of baseball, then finally basketball. And what I fell in love with was really the competition of it. It wasn't really, it wasn't necessarily basketball itself. It could have been football or baseball had I had more talent in those. But I fell in love with the competition of basketball, and I saw that I had a little bit of promise. I, looked, I felt like I had a chance to become at least mediocre in basketball, which I did not have in football because I never had equipment, so I never really found out. And I know I didn't have in baseball because I played and I knew I just wasn't good. So I didn't make my high school team, so I was a senior, got cut the first three years. We didn't have a JV or a freshman team. Made it as a senior, sat the bench that one year, had no college prospects, uh, naturally. Walked on at a D3 college, and there I actually started to develop some games. So it was after my senior year of high school that I started to feel a little bit more confident, like I was actually good. And then when I got to college, walking on at that D3, that's when I started to, you know, actually be a good player and be recognized as good by my peers, even though it was only, you know, it wasn't a basketball factory that I was at. It's not like I was at Duke or North Carolina. But that allowed me to kind of grow confidence. I was a small fish in a small pond, so I could kind of, kind of make myself into somebody. So by the time I graduated, I guess you could say I was a big fish in a tiny pond that nobody cared about. But I was able to take that somewhere else after college. I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. And so first thing, before we kind of talk about that after college plan, what I would love to hear a little bit about is you develop that confidence. And a, and a lot of people, not our listeners especially, but the people they work with, live with, believe confidence is just something you're born with. Like you either have it or you don't. But you just right there attested to the confidence was gained from, from the work, the work that you did, you working on your game. Tell us through that, kind of what was that progression when you – it started to click with you in high school that, man, I can do this. The biggest thing was one of my teammates, a guy who was actually the best player on the team, his name was Darian Shavis. He ended up with a D1 scholarship, and he was the best player. So he was averaging about 25 so points per game our senior year. He was on the all-city team in Philadelphia, which is a big deal. Yeah. A lot of talented players on that list. And he and I were classmates during the school day. And me and Darian and I weren't even like friends like that. We didn't know each other that well up until that year. And since we, but since we were in class together all day, I'm like at the end of the totem pole on the basketball team. He's the star with a scholarship offers. So I would just talk trash to him. Like, man, you're not better than me. I could beat you one-on-one. -on -one. And of course he knew he was better than me. So he loved it. You know, it was competition. Yeah. He was like, he knew he could beat me. So he, he bought into all the trash that I would talk to him. And we would play one-on-one -on -one before practice every day. And it wasn't like we were even keeping score. It was just a running game. Like, every day before practice, we just make eye contact. Like, all right, let's go. And we do this one-on-one. -on -one. And he was beating me. Over the course of the year, he won. But every now and then, I would score on him. Or every now and then, he would try to do a move on me, and I would stop him. And that's really what gave me the confidence. Because I'm looking at this guy. Like, this guy is one of the best in the city. And he's out there scoring 30 points in a game while I'm sitting on the bench watching him. But I know I can compete against this guy. I just needed to build my confidence up and get some more experience. Also, some more skill. But that was the first thing that gave me confidence. And then after my senior year, I was playing in this league called the Sunny Hill League, which is outside of Philly, one of the most popular amateur basketball leagues. All the best players around playing that. Kobe played in it, Wilt Chamberlain, Rip Hamilton, everybody from the Philly area, DeWan Wagner, they've all played in that league. 
And I was on a team in that league, sitting on the bench again. But in practice, I'm playing against – these are all the best players in the city that were on my team. I don't know if you remember Eddie Griffin, who was oh, the yeah. top, uh, top player in the nation, class of 2000, same year I graduated. He was on my team. And everybody else on the team was as good as him. And I was on the bench on that team. But, again, in practice, I would actually make some plays. And I'm like, man, I can actually hang with these guys. None of them ever bothered to learn my name. But <laughs> I was on that team practicing, and I was actually holding my own some days. And that, those are the things that gave me the confidence when I got into college that I knew I could compete. Man, and what I love that I don't want our listeners to miss out of that is you put yourself into competitive situations with people better than you people that had more experience, people that had that game. And your mindset, from what it sounds like, it wasn't worried about, am I going to lose? What's it going to look like? It's just like, I'm going to play against the best because it's going to make me better. And that's what we have to take life outside of sports. Like, we've got to take that same approach, not just from basketball court, weight room, but we've got to take that into the office and say, who's the best salesperson? How can I compete against them? How can I learn from them? How can I get better? Because that's what makes us better. When we continue to raise that game, if we try to play at people our level or less experienced because it's an easy win, we don't get better that way. We, we avoid those opportunities to grow. So let's talk about after college and what basketball and then life transitioning into your work now, kind of how was that journey? Sure, I'll try to condense it into a couple of minutes. So That's okay, man. Ahead. We got time. All right. So after college, I graduated from Penn State University. I went to Penn State Altoona, which is a D3 campus. But I graduated from Penn State with a business degree. And I told my parents I wanted to play professional basketball overseas. And they thought that was crazy because I didn't have the pedigree. I hadn't had much accomplishment. And, of course, they're my parents. So they knew that I didn't really have that much great going on in basketball. And then that first year, I didn't have any prospects. So my mom would ask me, well, do you have prospects? Is there? She didn't know how it worked, but she said, do you have a job offer? Do you have anything? I had nothing. So it was really like a pipe dream. And I would realistically and logically, they were absolutely right to point it out in that way. So my first year out of college, I worked a couple quote unquote regular jobs. I was an assistant manager of Foot Locker. I sold gym memberships at this gym called Valley Total Fitness. Yep. They're, now, they're now out of the business. I hope it's not because of me. But <laughs> then uh, after that year, I saved up some money. It was uh, actually $250 in cash. And I went to this event called an exposure camp, which for basketball players is like a job fair. But instead of talking and shaking hands, you actually go play. And you're playing with and against other players who want to play pro. I did great at that two-day event. I got the game footage from that uh, camp, which was actually on a VHS tape. Jake, you remember those? Oh, VHS. man, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, so that VHS, I actually made copies of it, and I started mailing that out to basketball agents that I was finding on Google. So I would just call them or email them cold. They had no idea who I was. I just told them, hey, here's my scouting report from this exposure camp. Here's my, fit, here's my footage. I can mail it to you. And I was just selling myself. And I found one agent who was willing to represent me. And he's the one who helped me start my pro basketball career overseas. And that was in August of 2005. Now, at the same time, that footage, I knew that a VHS tape, you drop it or somebody steps on it, it gets destroyed. And yep. that was the best footage I had of myself playing basketball. So I got that put on a data CD at an audio visual store, put it in this on my parents' desktop computer put it on this brand new website had just come out where you could put as much video up for free as you want it. It's called youtube.com. And that's how I started building a brand. I didn't know I was building a brand. So about four or five years later, but that's how I started two careers at the same time. That's awesome. So when basketball eventually ended and you transitioned into the work you do now, what, what was kind of that switch? Because for a lot of athletes, whether the career ends in high school, college, or we have the opportunity to play pro, like that transition period, one, mentally is tough because our identity has always been as this athlete. We've worked so hard to be this athlete, and then it's gone. The second piece is then what do I do next? Because it's kind of a blank slate for a lot of us, and, and a lot of people maybe listening today started a career that they're like, I don't really love it, but I don't know what I want to do next. Where did you start to connect the dots on this is the new path? This is what the next chapter needs to look like. Well, you know, Jake, actually my failures in basketball became my success when it came to entrepreneurship because as already everyone already knows, I went to a division three school. Where most athletes don't go pro. So even after I started playing professional basketball overseas, it's not like my career was this yellow brick road where everything worked out. There were years where I would have a contract and be playing, and there were years where I did not have a contract. I was unsigned. So about three, four years into my career, we're talking 2008, 2009-ish, I found myself unemployed again, and I, I was getting into my mid to late 20s. And I said, I got to get some control over my, my destiny, over my life. 
And I heard someone once say, if you just take where you are right now and you project that out for the next five years, would you be happy with that outcome? And my answer was no, I would not be happy with this outcome. So I asked myself this great question. How can I take two things that I really enjoy, which is playing basketball, and I'd always been a, a computer geek, a computer nerd. And when I first came across the internet, I knew it was for me. How can I combine these two things and make money so I can have some control over my life? So that was the key question that I asked myself. And that led me to looking at, I would put up videos on YouTube maybe once a month, whenever I felt like it. I would record something. It would sit on my desktop computer for months because I didn't care. It was no money in YouTube at this time, yeah. mind you. So, and then I said, well, how about I just put a little bit more time into this? And then Google bought YouTube and you could actually make money from the advertisements on your videos. It wasn't a ton of money, but it was money. This, this is a brand new thing. Yep. So I started putting videos up every day. I started investing a little bit more into my website that I had at that time. Eventually started making products. I had been reading a lot of Tim Ferriss at the time. Yep. So he would talk about these experiments you could do online to test the product. This is back when you could take $5 in Google ads and yep. actually get some results. So, That's right. Yeah, those of y'all who remember the good old days. So <laughs> I started making my own products around 2009. And so I was already into entrepreneurship, Jake, and I kept playing ball until 2015. But at that point, about halfway through my career, I already knew what else I could do. I can make products. And when I sold my first product, $4.99 PDF, I said, man, I made this out of no nothing and I made money out of it. This is what I need to be doing. This is my retirement plan. I can do this even when my knees aren't good anymore. <laughs> So that was how I knew where I was going. And the, one more thing I'll tell you is that outside of the basketball videos I was putting on YouTube, because all my content was just basketball on the court doing drills at that yep. time. But people started asking me about mindset because I would tell a little bit of my story. how I didn't make it in high school, et cetera. And I started talking about uh, every Monday I did the video called the, the weekly motivation. I would talk about discipline, confidence, mental toughness, personal initiative. And people started messaging me and saying, Dre, I'm not a basketball player, but I subscribe to you on YouTube because I want to see that video you put out every Monday. It would just be a random thought that I was just off the top of my head. I'd be driving, holding the camera, driving, talking. And people started really loving those. And I did those videos for about 400 straight Mondays. And those were the seed for what I talk about now with Work On Your Game. I love it. I love it. Well, and one of the things about your brand that I appreciate most is Work On Your Game. It it's similar to competing, like competing every day. It's about embracing the process. What are you doing today to get better? What are you doing today to work on your game? And I think in a society today that's so driven by quick fix results, we want Amazon Prime to show up with all of our goals and successes, and it, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes you're working on your game for 10 years before that opportunity arrives. Where did that mindset, has that mindset been with you since high school from just trying to make that varsity team through the rest of your life? Were there challenges overseas playing ball that you were like, this just needs to be my focus on the process instead of just that outcome piece? Well, in high school, it was always about just make the basketball team. That's all that I knew. Because mind you, we're talking, I graduated from high school in 2000. So yeah. In the late 90s, I mean, we had computers, but not really computers. Man, we dial up, yeah. Yeah, not really in it. This is when you got the Sunday paper and tried to find that free AOL CD. You know That's I mean? right. Right, so <laughs> it wasn't how it is now. Nothing like this. So for all the Gen Zers, y'all don't know, but y'all can ask your parents. Yep. But back then, it was just make the basketball team. When I got into college, I started to learn a little bit more because one of my teammates – he actually knew some guys who played overseas and he would tell me a few things, but he, we didn't really know. There was no podcast. There were no videos. There were no books. There was no nothing, no articles, nothing. Then when I graduated from college and I knew that I wanted to play ball overseas and I, at first I had no prospects, that was the only thing I was focused on was just make it, get an opportunity. I just needed to get on the court to show what I could do. That's all I was aiming for. It only really became process, Jake, once I got on and I was playing. And then I saw how things were starting to develop on the internet for me and how I was starting to draw an audience even though nobody knew my name. And then I thought to myself, when people start watching the videos and they would say, well, how often do you practice? Or who taught you how to play? Or can you make a video about crossovers? Or can you dunk? And things like that. I thought, I initially I thought to myself, Jake, that every basketball player goes to the gym every day and practices. I didn't think it was a big deal. I'm, yeah. like, I'm some nobody, nobody guy from a D3. Why do they even care about me? What I realized was that all players don't do this. <laughs> all players don't practice every day. They don't show up every day and just do the work. So I realized what was coming naturally to me was something that was actually unique. 
And that's when I realized, oh, the fact that I'm doing this is different from what all other players do. So that's when I started putting up videos out every day. And 99% of people who know me don't never saw me play a second of overseas basketball. They know me from YouTube. Yeah. So that is where that process began. How do you uh, how do you stay focused on the process, especially now as as you do more speaking, you're doing corporate work, you're still putting out videos and content, especially with social media. It's easy to get distracted where someone else is, what someone else is doing, everything that kind of pulls at our attention. How do you continue to just work on your game every day and not allow those outside distractions to, to derail you or slow you down? Well, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was from one of my virtual mentors not a person I know, but I follow a uh, name, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs. And one of the things I heard- Virtual, was, man. He was playing in my headphones in high school. Come on now. <laughs> exactly. I still listen to it now. So, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I heard him say was one of the keys to his success is that he doesn't pay attention to what anybody else is doing. And that's one of the things that I try to adopt myself. I try not to, I use Instagram, but when I go, to, I don't click on the Explore tab or I'll click on it and just see what's on that first frame, but I don't scroll. So I'm not looking at what everybody else is doing. I try to focus more on doing what I'm doing so I can get to the point that people are looking up me and trying to nope. figure out what I got going on instead of me looking at what everyone else has going on. Because what I tell people in my audience all the time, these social media the engineers there are smarter than us. Right? They know how to suck all the time out of your life and sell it to advertisers and you don't get a cut of the money. That's so right. you got to understand, you got to understand the game that's being played that they're using you. The app is quote unquote free, but they're sucking your life away from you. And then you've got to put a price tag on that. So the focus that I tell everybody is really focus on what you're doing so that you build something that other people will give their resources to so they can get something from you, not you giving yours to everybody else. You're either going to be a producer or a consumer. You got to pick one. I love that. I love that. Well, one of the things you recently posted on there was about getting back into training because COVID and quarantine, you hadn't been in the gym. And, and a lot of people, man, sitting in that same spot, depending on where you live is depending on if it's still locked down or if it's open back up. And a lot of people want to jump right back in and think, man, I can get back to where I was in February or I can get back to where I was 10 years ago in two weeks. And it doesn't work that way. And a lot of times we end up burning out so fast on that. You jumping back in had a quick formula for just how you're approaching to work on your game. I'd love if you could share that for our listeners that are probably stepping into the same position you are just now getting back into that training. Absolutely. I'll try to remember what I wrote there. So the number one thing is don't try to get it all back in one day. And this is something in some areas of life, people think they'll be able to do it because maybe it's just a matter of getting someone else to comply or go along with it. But we're talking about being in the gym. If you used to be able to jump high, but you had you no know, knee surgery or you're lifting weights, you go in the gym and try to deadlift 300 pounds and you haven't deadlifted in months, so you're going to wreck your back. back right? your, body's yep. gonna tell you, your body's going to tell you really quickly that you can't do it. You're going to have to work your way up. The second thing is figuring out what your process is going to be. Because when you have a process that you can trust, whether it's something that you've done before, whether you're working with, it, let's say, a trainer or some expert who already knows the way and you trust that they know the way, then you don't have to try to do everything in one day. You don't have to try to make up 10 weeks of work in 10 hours of work. You, can, you know you can follow the process day by day and eventually you want to get to where you want to get to. And the last thing is just showing up, showing up and doing what you need to do today. So today you might start off. I remember deadlifting. I, I might have used that as an example. I don't remember. But at my peak of deadlifting, I was deadlifting about 350 pounds. I weigh about a buck 80. So I was deadlifting about 350. But when I went back to the gym, I started at 185. Let me just start at 185. It was easy. But I, I go up 10 pounds each time. So I just went in there today. I'm up to about 215. So I'm slowly going to build my way back up. But it's just step by step of following the process. And it's a discipline. It is a discipline to doing that because a lot of people don't want to do the stuff that's not so you know, impressive. You don't feel like you're really doing anything. But this is all part of the game. Anyone who builds something that, is, that stands the test of time, the strongest part of it is the foundation. That's the part that nobody sees is the part, if you look at a skyscraper, it's underground. Nobody will ever see that foundation again unless the building gets, gets demolished or it falls down, God forbid. And that's the part that matters the most. It's not the part at the top where they put the pool on the roof. It's the part at the bottom that nobody ever sees. Only the people who constructed the building know about it, but that's the part that makes all the rest of it, allows the rest of it to exist. 
That's exactly right, man. I love that. Thank you so much for taking some time to share that. I know that's a big encouragement for a lot of our listeners that probably just feel the overwhelm of like, man, how am I ever going to get back to where it was or what habits have I built the last six months that I need to get rid of? Dre, where is the best place to, for listeners to get connected with you? You've got book, two books, right? I got a lot of books. Actually. You got a lot of, okay. I was about to say, I knew of a couple of them. You've got gear, you've got a ton of stuff. And then like we talked about, you put out some great content online. Where can people, one, pick up a copy of your book, but get connected and follow along with your work? Well, great. Well, first I'll tell you uh, one of my books that people can get for free and they just cover the shipping. That is called The Mirror of Motivation. So the working again philosophy based on four principles, discipline, confidence, mental toughness, and personal initiative. First one being discipline. The subtitle of The Mirror of Motivation is The Self-Guide to Self-Discipline. And what that book does for people is that a lot of people have to understand that since everyone who listens to this show, you probably have goals and you probably understand that you can't get something for nothing. You got to put some work in to get it. The question that most people never ask, though, is what type of person do I need to be? Meaning, how do I need to see myself? What kind of energy do I need to carry myself with? Who do I need to see when I look in the mirror while I'm taking those actions in order to reach my outcomes? This book, The Mirror Motivation, will show you how that's done. It's a framework for how that's done, not because I'm so great and I'm going to hype you up, but because I'm going to show you how to look in the mirror and do it for yourself. That's why the book is called The Mirror of Motivation. So you can get that book for free. Just cover a small shipping charge by going to mirrorofmotivation.com. As far as uh, where to find me, I'm on every social media platform. So whichever one you like, I'm active on all of them. Instagram, of course, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. The only thing I don't do is TikTok videos. Or I'm on YouTube. I have plenty. I have several websites. So, I mean, you just Google me and then type in the name of your favorite platform. I'm there. I'm active every day. I respond on all of them. I love it. I love it, Dre, man. Well, thank you so incredibly much for coming on the Compete Everyday podcast this week. Listeners, give the man a follow. Absolutely pick up that free book. All you got to do is cover shipping. So I know you've all already finished the Compete Everyday books, and now you've got a new one to add to your list. And what a gracious offer he's given us. So man, thank you so much for hanging out this week. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Jake.